Hello everybody, and this week I've been having a little bit of a tinker around with a collection of games, rather than just one. Isn't that exciting? And what's great is that they were actually on the service known as PlayStation Plus. So can I please get an intro now? So, yes, for the first time in this show's history, I'll be covering not one, not two, but three games in one video. Yes, they will be briefer reviews, but I'll be talking about three games nonetheless. And what's great is that these three games have been highly requested reviews for quite a while now, and what's even better is that they all came on PlayStation Plus. For those who don't know, PlayStation Plus is basically a service for anyone that owns a PS4, PS3, or PS Vita, and what this service does is that for a yearly payment of about £40, you get access to a load of games that you can keep as long as you remain a member, and you get loads of discounts on the PlayStation Store and multiplayer on PS4. And these three games I'll be talking about today are some of my top picks from the service, and they are Valiant Hearts The Great War, Fez, and Towerfall Ascension. And for anyone that wants to share their favourite picks from PlayStation Plus, please leave a comment below. First off, Valiant Hearts, which was made available for PS4 users on March 2015 with PlayStation Plus, and all I can say is... Oh my, the feels. Valiant Hearts is a Ubisoft game which returns to a 2D cartoony approach to the game, like the company's early days with the original Rayman, and it also has a unique art style. Hopefully this means that Ubisoft will make more games like this. Wink, wink. However, unlike Rayman, Valiant Hearts is a game that focuses more on puzzle solving, multiple character threads, darker themes, and a highly engrossing story wrapped around horrific true events, and I actually really did end up enjoying it. The gameplay in Valiant Hearts, like I just said, is basically based around 2D puzzle solving. You get to play as multiple characters in this game, which all have their own unique abilities thrown into the mix, such as digging through trenches with a spade, and cutting ropes and wires with wire cutters, and um, high strength for fist fighting and stuff like that, commanding a faithful dog to help you out in some puzzles, first aid applications which also involve rhythm games, and um, all that kind of stuff. But the main focus of the game is puzzle solving. You'll be looking around your environment, avoiding the one hit death threats from the war going on around you, pushing and pulling objects, climbing boxes and ladders, and pulling levers, turning cranks, breaking through rubble, throwing projectiles, and so much more. Even including some surprisingly good 2D stealth sections involving distracting enemies, hiding behind cover, and taking enemies out from behind. And this is also you can progress through the story and gradually watch as the First World War gets worse around you. The puzzles overall I thought were really good in this game. I mean, there are a few of them which are very, very straightforward and very pick up one item, use it here, pick up another item, use it here. So, in other words, pretty easy and not so inspired. But then there are other puzzles which actually throw a lot of point and click adventure themes and feelings into the mix, and it makes you use your imagination a lot more because of that, and in a 2D plane using platforming controls, it works surprisingly well. These puzzles were easily the best and the most awesome for me. I especially love the puzzles where you have to command your dog to do something else while you do something else at the same time. Th th that was really awesome stuff. And I really was surprised how natural it all felt on this 2D plane. Another way the game feels natural is with the presentation as a whole and the way that it works really, really well with the themes of the game. The way your characters move and have this slight squash and stretch to their walking animation feels great to control. And the distinctive, almost comic book-esque art style gives gives a lot of charm and character to the game, but it never strays into childish and cheesy. It's, it gives the proper depth and darkness to the situations and people that you meet throughout the journey. And it's because of all these things that led me to get really invested and connected with all the characters in this game, even though most of them have no major dialogue whatsoever. I was also connected with the game by the awesome narrative structure that it has. The way this game's story unravels and unfolds through the horrific and tragically horrid events of World War One, I, I found utterly engrossing. And that was heightened even more so by the multiple characters that you play as and the way that all of their branching character paths and stories cross together and merge seamlessly. Through this and the excellently grand and often sorrowful soundtrack which gets me every time, I was emotionally invested in this story and oh the feels. If you played this game and enjoyed it as much as I did, you know exactly what I mean. I also loved all the little visual details that worked their way into the gameplay itself, like um, looking in the background to see groups of soldiers charging into gunfire and getting knocked down, or seeing random people in the distance choking on deadly gas. It not only painted a morbid and dreadful picture of the atrocities committed at that time period, but also provided a sense of unpredictability and tension in the gameplay. At any moment, you wouldn't know what would happen next. 
Would a bomb go off? Would a building collapse? Would gas seep into the room that you're standing in? Would you be pelted with gunfire? Would you have to hide from incoming enemy troops? I adored how all of these elements worked their ways together and it made all of those scenes where you have to trudge through hordes of dead bodies with flies everywhere and stuff like that much more impactful because of all of that stuff. It's like, even though it's cartoony and everything, it actually ended up portraying war itself in one of the more mature, emotional and grittiest representations I've seen in gaming in a long time. Especially from a big company like Ubisoft, and I would say that it's actually done a better job here than most other war games that try and go for a more realistic look. It's very impressive. As far as things I didn't like about this game go, well, firstly, I really didn't like how in some instances during the puzzles, your character could only pick up one item at a time, and that's, that's fine, but you couldn't drop that item wherever you wanted to drop it. You had to, the only way you could drop the item was to pick up another item. So some of the puzzles involved a lot of pointless running back and forth, picking up items just because I couldn't drop an item and save it for later in some place I wanted to drop it. And like I said earlier, yeah, some of the puzzles aren't exactly spectacular in any way, but those two things are nitpicks in what is otherwise a great and lengthy game, not to mention fantastically paced. And to top it all off, I even learnt more about World War One in an hour's worth of playing this game than I ever learned in all of my years going through school. And I thought the inclusion of throwing in all of those real life pictures taken from World War One and hiding all of these tiny little factoids in the in like disguised as collectibles hidden around all the areas, I found were an awesome touch. And I found everything that I saw or picked up completely, utterly fascinating, if not horrible at the same time. I was hooked to this game the second I started playing, and for anyone that's a puzzle game fan, or anyone that's looking for a good old emotional outburst, then I think you'll enjoy this game as much as I did too. Talking about Fez though, that was made available for PlayStation Plus in August 2014 for PS4, PS3, and PS Vita users, and it's one of the most interesting, mysterious, and relaxing games I've ever played. Fez puts you in the shoes of one of the cutest little guys ever, Gomez, who lives happily in one of the most beautifully organic and serene 2D pixel art towns you could ever wish to live. Until one day, he ends up accidentally witnessing the massive destruction of a giant cube. And this cube collapsing basically throws the entire universe out of balance. Who'd have thought it? And so Gomez has to go and retrieve each broken little part of the cube, put it back together and save the day. However, yes, the game is called Fez, and there is a reason for that. It's because Gomez finds very early on in the game a magical Fez, which allows him to flip his universe in any four angles that he wants to, giving a new perception and angle on the entire world. After that happens, that's when Fez turns into something truly special. By manipulating the angle of the world, Gomez must explore a huge universe of delicately crafted and utterly breathtaking floating hexahedron villages and towns in order to find every missing piece of this magical cube and fix everything to the way it was. The art style of this game is one of the most detailed and authentic I've ever seen in a pixel art style, and the music of the game creates one of the most calming, adventurous, dangerous, and explorative atmospheres I've ever experienced in a game, period. It's just incredible how many moods the game conveys with the presentation alone, especially when the time of day is constantly shifting through the world as you explore. Not to mention with the perspective flipping mechanic, um, that gives Fez advantages both both stylistically and gameplay-wise. Being able to see every angle of this gorgeous world and witness all of the little tiny details happening around every single side is always nice, but by flipping perspectives you also flip the way the platforms align, where they're placed in the universe, the pathways you can take, the doors you can enter. The entire game is based around flipping perspectives in order to solve the game's many, many, many platforming puzzles and find all of the really well hidden cube pieces in order to beat it. And with the way the perspective works and how your character can move around the universe depending on that perspective, kind of feels a lot like that um, PSP game, Echo Chrome. Did anyone ever play that? No? There are no boss fights, no enemies, no life bar, no game overs, just the extent of your curiosity and persistence through some of the trickier puzzles later on in the game. If you miss a jump, handle a bomb for too long, or get caught in a rip between time and space, Gomez will simply respawn straight away from the last platform he jumped on, meaning that the only limits to this game are not only your skill and your hardcore practice, but your imagination and experimentation with all the tools and flipping mechanics that you have around you. By flipping perspectives, the game more or less hands you the freedom with how you choose to explore each and every area. If a platform seems impossible to reach, give the world a flip and see if you can work a way to get near it. If a mountain seems impossible to climb, give the world a flip and see if you can align a ladder while you climb it. It's because of this simple yet very deep game mechanic that makes this game feel extremely fresh and a wondrous experience every time I decide to pick it up. And the only major complaint I have with the game is that 
It does like to get very cryptic in some areas. I'm all for difficult puzzles and everything, but this game is... Jeez! If you're someone like me who likes beating these kinds of games 100%, I would say it's close to impossible to actually beat this game 100% without some sort of outside help of any description. I mean, obviously people have done that in the past, because where would the hints have come from? But for an average gamer, this these puzzles are too cryptic for most average gamers, I would say. You see, you can just find all the pieces of the cube and restore it and then leave it at that. I mean, that's the point of the game. But for those looking for that extra bit of challenge, you can look for all of the anti-cube pieces. And these rely on finding hidden rooms with hidden code breaking sequences and hidden messages all over the walls and hidden treasure maps and everything is hidden and it's so difficult and you have to manipulate the game's mechanics in insane degrees like finding a particular room and then flipping the world in a particular order a certain amount of times or uh, yeah, like I said, code cracking. Basically, really hardcore stuff. There are some which are very difficult, but not impossible to figure out, and they make you feel really smart when you get them. I found a few anti-cubes myself, and I felt really good for doing so. But some of the anti-cube puzzles made no sense to me whatsoever, even after looking up a few of the solutions to some of these puzzles, and then looking back to the game's clues that it gave me, I was left scratching my head to how the person that gave me the hint came to that conclusion in the first place. I was mind blown. Maybe I'm an idiot. I don't know. But all I know is that some of these puzzles did really throw me off and frustrate me in what is otherwise one of the most peaceful and just charming games I've ever played. And yes, if you haven't done so yet, give this game a try. I'm sure it'll be a little bit too different for some people, but I really enjoyed it, so make what you want from that. Towerfall Ascension, on the other hand, was made available for PS4 users in July 2014, and, um... It transitions into insanity a little bit. Okay, maybe not as insane as some games like Rezogun, for instance, but still hard as nails. And hey, it's pixel art again, just like Fez. See, it's all connected somehow. Towerfall is a very fun and addictive 2D arcade game. The story is basically you picking one of four characters to ascend a tower. That's it. There are a good amount of stages, not the most I've ever seen from a game like this, but still, a normal and hard mode, and then the game's most prominent aspect, the multiplayer. To go through the single player and explain the gameplay a little bit more though, in Towerfall, you're basically pitted in each stage on a static screen. You begin with a small amount of arrows for your bow and arrow, and then immediately you're thrown against tons of enemies, which increase in difficulty as you go through each wave. Then you beat the stage, and then witness all of the nicely coloured and nicely themed and nicely characterised visuals and music as you go on, and it all happens with a tight and responsive control scheme. Sounds simple, right? Well, not quite, because some enemies have weak spots, some enemies go into a dizzy period after you attack them once, some enemies will deflect your arrows and then leave themselves vulnerable, and some enemies are just best to just jump on their heads. With this knowledge, you think you have this game in the bag, but here's the thing, you die in one hit, and you only have about four lives on average per stage. Sure, you can find power-ups like wings and shields and extra arrows and even more powerful arrows like bomb arrows, but this game solely relies on testing your skills and reflexes with a limited supply of things. Even going to the point of rewarding your successful timing and successful dodging mid-air to grab airborne arrows that are fired at you from other enemies. I mean, you can even kill yourself with your own arrows, and in some stages which have no sides and no flaws, this basically means that you, enemies, attacks, and arrows alike can appear from one end of the screen, appear on the other end, drop through the floor of one stage and appear through the top of another, and basically surround you and kill you. The second you let your guard down in this game is the second that you die, and that's what turns Towerfall into an insanely satisfying 2D arcade game. And the intensity is heightened even further by the game's hectic nature that expects you to master and tweak your own self-coordination in order to take in every sprite that exists around you, north, east, south and west. And the mechanic of having only a limited arrows on you at only one time, I thought added a lot of strategy to the action of this game. I mean, if you could just bow an arrow at absolutely any enemy that you wanted to at any point, the game would be much easier. But deciding which enemies deserve killing with an arrow, and deciding which enemies you should save your arrows for, or deciding which enemies you should kill with an arrow, and then figuring out where you should fire the arrow because you have to then go and pick up that arrow to get it back, all of these different things work together so well. It adds that layer of depth to what is already a fun and intense, like I said, arcade game. And the game makes you tackle decisions like that while you're running around for your life all over the map. And the game gets really, really hard as it goes on, especially on the hard mode of some of the stages. Leading me, personally, to get over 250 attempts, as in game overs, on one particular stage in hard mode. I'm still terrible at this game. I'm sad. Cry for me. 
Even with the second player helping you out on the story mode of this game, you have to be engaged and locked onto each other from the second you start because you can even kill your s each other with your own arrows. This is a game about speed, reflexes, multitasking and in complete coordination when you have a second player involved. And if you like tough as nails games like this, it's a roaring good time. Even if the adventure mode itself isn't anything too special just because of the genre of game that this is. And like I said earlier, this game truly shines on the multiplayer aspect. Well, well, mostly anyway. This game is very easy to pick up, but tricky to master. A very good sign for any game that's built like this, and very good for other people that want to play it with you. The multiplayer in this game is top-notch, if you couldn't really imagine by looking at the gameplay. Not only do you have the two-player adventure mode, but you also have a lot of competitive multiplayer modes as well. The modes aren't anything mind-blowing, I mean you get free-for-all, team deathmatch, and last man standing, that kind of stuff, but with the static images of this game and the control scheme that this game goes for, this game lavishes in its own brand of couch co-op, something that I have been craving in games in general for a long time. In any match that I've played with friends, it's fast-paced, hilarious, challenging, and satisfying and hours would go by without anybody even realising. Grab some drinks and some snacks and then sit back and kick each other's asses. That is what this game excels at and it does it brilliantly. That's where this game shines and that's what also makes the adventure mode much more memorable than just playing it alone. It's not too dissimilar to the way that Smash Brothers works, for instance, but on a 2D arcade arena kind of style. However, I did say that multiplayer mostly is the highlight with this game because Unfortunately, there's no online multiplayer with this game. This does really suck for those who can't play very easily with friends or can't do couch co-op in general, but the game really, really feels like it needs it. Also, I'm not too amazingly fond of the game's soundtrack. I mean, it's good, it's okay, but some of the tracks I found very repetitive and very droning and not very exciting for what was going on on screen. There are a few tracks which are really good, but some of them out one ear, in, in the other. I mean, in one ear, out the other, you know what I mean. Still though, this is a really, really good game, and going back to the multiplayer point again, um, even if this game did have a multiplayer mode online, I would still recommend playing this game Couch Co-op. That's what this game feels best for, it's the physical interaction that makes this game the kind of game that it is. And that's what makes this game shine enough for me to give it a good recommendation, as well as the hard as hell quest mode, single player or multiplayer. But just... Don't come crying to me if you can't beat the harder difficulties. Just, I warned you. Overall, these three games are great, and I personally can't recommend the service enough if you own any of the three consoles I've been talking about. And I personally can't thank the service enough for introducing me to some really great games over the years, like Metro Last Light, Lone Survivor, Rayman Origins, Batman Arkham City, Dead Space 2, Machinarium, Guacamelee, and Binding of Isaac Rebirth, and Strider, and Hotline Miami, and, and Steamworld Dig, and so much more. When I got PlayStation Plus for the first time, I ended up um, getting a yearly subscription, but then in the first month of having that subscription, all the games that I got on all the systems that I got all the games on, they exceeded the value of the yearly subscription in the first month, and they were all great games on every system that I got all the games on. So the value is incredible as well. And so altogether, after tinkering around with Valiant Hearts, Fez and Towerfall, and PlayStation Plus as a whole, I would have to rate the whole experience overall as unbelievable. The value for money, the quality of games that you get, and all the discounts make this service just fantastic as far as I'm concerned. And especially worth it if you want to add a little bit more spice and experimentation with your PlayStation games collection. Oh, and by the way, for this month, free games are, well, Valiant Hearts, that's one of them, and Oddworld New and Tasty. <laughs> Farewell everybody, and until next time, take care. Hello there everybody and thanks so much for watching my, um, well, three reviews in one video on stuff that I got from PlayStation Plus. Um, if you enjoyed this video, please show that you did by leaving a little like for this video and um, consider subscribing to my channel because I now upload two videos every single week except when I'm ill or on holiday, so that's always nice. I mean, if you look in the description, you'll find all my social medias, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch. I go streaming a lot more often than I used to, so that's always worth a look. And you'll also find my Games Grabber collection in the description as well, which is basically my games collection. What games am I buying? What games am I sticking on my shelf? It's updated on a daily basis and you can find all that out by going into the description and finding out from the Games Grabber link and you might be able to buy a few of the games yourself straight from the site. So that's always nice. And as always, if it's your birthday today watching this video, then happy freaking birthday to you and please remember to stay beautiful.